and we are live and hopefully you can hear us all okay i am in the production seat today apologies this is not my forte but hopefully we'll uh we we'll get along okay uh delighted to be joined by nisha waldron this morning to unpack so much from a mad weekend of hurling nisha a crazy weekend of hurling by all accounts yeah savage like and sure it's a kind of it's the kind of one you always like about the club championship um it's just a in one way, I suppose it was a shame that they were all on on like the same day and in around the same kind of eighteen hour time frame because it was hard to see them all. Like, um, but uh, some massive, some massive results really. Uh, even even like you know even something like Thomas's win in six in a row, incredible. But then like all the new champions we got. Um, so yeah, it was class class day all around. It was as you said. There was nearly too much going on at the one at the mm. one time. You would love to see four or five different games yesterday. But uh, you're obviously a Kilkenny man, first and foremost, Nisha. Did you see that coming? Um, I, I, I knew they were slipping. I knew Ballyhale were slipping. And I think O'Loughlin's played the game probably on their own terms and made sure they didn't concede a goal. But, like, like it was, you have to say, a monumental upset all the same. Yeah, huge, like, in loads of ways. Like, Ballyhale, Shamrock's going for six in a row, trying to topple Tullerone's record. Um, but during the year... Loads of people were saying it that they weren't going to win it this year, and the, and the way they had been winning, I suppose that can only last so long. And, and Colin Fenley coming over and back, you know that that that's a real drag and a drain as well. And you know, even, even during, remember, I was down for the for the Dixborough and, and uh, Shamrocks game, the quarter final, and they were very very. Now they played very well, but they were very lucky to come out of that game. Like like Dixborough really threw it away, and even before the game. I was talking to lads and they, and and the whole everybody basically I said or spoke to said it'll be a Dixborough or Lachlan's county final and that uh, Dixborough should win this game by seven or eight points. I didn't believe that at the time now, but they they left they left that game behind them. So yeah, I kind of expected O'Loughlin's to win. To be honest, I actually wasn't surprised by it at all. Um, it was the game I was hoping we were going to be down for uh, with TG Gatter, but we weren't. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, look at a huge shock and fair play to O'Loughlin's. Uh, it's a long, it's a while since they won it. What we, we beat them in Leinster, we beat them in the Leinster final in 2016, so that's the last time they won it. Yeah, yeah, uh, we'll fly through a load of comments, uh, loads of comments in from all our viewers today. Uh, tight marker, hi guys, why wasn't there any coverage of the Kilkenny final? We need a dedicated G a hurling channel to be honest with you. I think it was absolute madness that probably the greatest club team of all time. There was a chance that their throne was going to be taken off them yesterday, and I, I just couldn't understand how it was on TV. And fair play, it's great, it's great to have Clubber uh, in in place for something like that and the streaming service. But I, I was very surprised. You're obviously working with one of the channels that that brought the broadcast the matches, so that might be a tricky one. But I was I was surprised that it wasn't on telly. But the, yeah, this was the dilemma, I suppose, because the Galway final wasn't shown either. So like, there was the yeah. Galway final was on, the Dublin final was on. So like we have like one of our here's the kind of dilemma you end up in right one of our production one of our main producers Finton uh, Finton Welsh or, or Finton Bernock um, his brother was playing with Nafina they're a big Nafina family and he didn't even get to go to the match like he was down in tip with us like where he again we showed it last year he was hoping they'd win it last year and they didn't so then he was like oh we can't show it this year and I'd say it would have been only for the tip final went to a replay would have been the Kilkenny final and TG Carr and then the Dublin final and RTE but just just the way it worked out they felt they have to show the tip replay um, unfortunately now like uh, when I was asked I suggested uh, the Kilkenny final because I I was kind of said I think this is the year they will lose that Shamrocks will lose so and look I don't know look it, it's just one of them things there's too many games all on, all on around the same time if the tip replay wasn't on it would have worked out fine um, there would have been no issue, but just unfortunate. It's typical, you, it's typical tip get getting the get in the way of everything. But sure, listen, that's 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 yeah. not the new affairs now. Just yeah. through a few other comments there. Joe Butler, a proud uh, All Auckland Gales man, says, "Come on, the locks! What a contest! What a game! They thrown the Super Champions Bally Hale. Sheer resilience, never said die attitude, and desire won it for All Auckland. They surely did. We go into my new detail in a couple of minutes on it." Trowman Speeder says, "Only one game on TG4 yesterday. Such a shame. County boards are blocking a national audience." Seeing their games, the prize players of exposure, which the game, which the game needs to thrive. 
Um, Joe Butler in again says the trip from Castlebar was worth it. Michael, your early prediction came true. A man of great vision and wisdom. <laughs> I don't know about that, Joe. Jesus, Joe, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't read the comment before you, before you, before um, before I put up on the screen. Richard Hogan says, just says, Joe, did Michael join the celebration yesterday? Congrats to all the OLG. I was actually invited up to the clubhouse. Would you believe? Because we did a show there um, a few months back, and it's funny. I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, Nisha, where you're around people that are at the call phase in the club and I just had a good chat with Brian Hogan that night and just got generally it was more of a I knew that they probably didn't have the forwards potentially to win a Kilkenny championship but you know when you just get a vibe about a scenario that things are motoring nicely by all accounts he yeah. ended up in the in the job in the kind of unique circumstances he was doing a masters he was on the selection committee for to pick the next manager um, and it just kept going on and on and he ended up being manager himself. He, he went into a meeting one night and his name was down on a, on a page for ratification. And he said, what's going on here? Um, but he, he basically had uh, Nigel Skeen and a few other lads, I think Alan Gagan and a few other lads basically held the fort until he finished his Masters and then he came in and yeah, just got a, got a vibe around it. Um, we just chat about the, about the game itself, Nisha. I know I was down there, so if you want to fire anything, uh, any questions at me, you can, but just... They got off to a really, really good start. You have to, with the Shamrocks, you can't let them dictate affairs. They got their matchups right. Um, even though Hugh Lawler had a tough enough afternoon on, on own Cody, probably particularly in the first half, I'd say. Um, Paddy Deegan had tough moments against TJ, but went was able to get up and go forward a bit as well, as you saw at that brilliant point. I think Mikey Butler completely sacrificed his game just to follow Adrian Mullen. I'd say if he got the ball in his hand twice. That was as, as much as he touched the ball. But Adrian Mullen got his two scores before half time. But outside of that, didn't wasn't able to really dictate affairs. They they put Tony Forrestal in on Colin Fenley, who did a good job on him a couple of years ago. Mm. That kind Indeed, of worked. Yeah. yeah, Colin Colin got into the game more when he came out centre forward. But he was clearly on one leg and really really struggling. Yeah. He he couldn't he couldn't dash after a lad hundred percent to to make it hard for Hugh to come out or make it hard for Mikey Butler to come out and. Even just the benches, Ballyhill. Like, I, 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 have you ever seen it in the county final where only fifteen men were used in a, you know, in a tight game? I, I've never seen it before. I suppose when you're missing Joey Holden, Matty Kenny missing... often did it. <laughs> it sounds like a small bit of bitterness might be there, uh, but um, when you're missing the likes of Joey Holden, when you're missing uh, Ron and Cork, when you're missing Brian Cody. Alan Cuddy, Darren Mullen was only on the extended panel, not properly togged out yesterday. I think all of those things really came home to roost, but Lachlan Gales got a hell of a lot of things right. Like Richie Reid was made a bit of a hero for maybe 10 or 15 minutes in the first half, and then they bypassed him in the second half, and he just wasn't allowed to get on a load of ball. It was funny, you remarked to me after the the, the, the quarterfinals, particularly the, the village and Grey Bally Callan game, how direct and old school it was. Like this was as direct as it as it comes yesterday. And I thought that was a mistake by Bally Hale at times, because it kind of suited to be putting ball down on top of Paddy Deegan and Hugh Lawler. I thought they've I thought they'd be that bit maybe that bit more class if they'd if they'd worked it through the lines maybe a bit more and tried to do a bit more of that. They didn't really it wasn't that kind of free flowing style. It was more kind of kind of route one, but it's amazing. If you look at it down the home straight, you're thinking Bally Hale have all the nous and all the know-how down the home straight. They know exactly how to get over the line. And I know O'Loughlin's missed a couple of chances down the home straight, but they were the ones that were pushing. And that's such a unique thing, isn't it, with the champions? Yeah. The underdogs are the ones that are pushing. The under underdogs are the ones that are pushing the envelope. And David Fogarty, who had had a, a shot off the post just before that, threw over a lovely point. And then Paddy Deegan just took the game by the scruff of the neck and put over that winner. A sensational finish to a, a crazy game. Yeah, like, uh, and e even a couple of years ago when the Lachlans were in the final, they got beaten in the final when Andy Comerford was over and by, by the Shamrocks again. Like, But even that day, I thought, you know, Lachlans aren't far off this, you know. It was just that day, they were probably too young, a lot of them not ready because physically it was the last kind of 10, 15 minutes they just really, really petered out and... Valley Hill just took over the game, or the Shamrocks took over the game and, and, and finished it out strongly. But see the like of Paddy Deegan and that kind of a performance yesterday, very similar to Willie Connors with Killadangan. I always love watching county lads do that with the club, where you're kind of like, I, I think you kind of take for granted, or you're watching lads at county level and you're kind of like, God, he, uh, you know, he's not really standing out, or Jesse, maybe he wasn't brilliant that day. But then you see them playing against club players, and you're like, my God, this lad is. He is on a different level than the ordinary players, but like I almost think like um, it, it's nearly more honourable when somebody plays better for the club than they do for the county, if you get me. 
that it like it looks like and feels like it means way more and you can you can actually see it and sense it and like Kilkenny was when I was growing up and fl- still playing at Kilkenny at adult level like and stuff uh, there was a, a, an awful lot of lads like that like Ray Wall with Mullen Levat, I remember was like he, uh, he was like okay wasn't you know shooting the lights out or playing unbelievably well with Kilkenny or he was on the panel for a long time but with Mullen Levat, you were like right how do you avoid Ray Wall and then like you know Michael Grace with the Ronan She was another lad in the forest so like I always love watching uh, performances like that from Paddy Deegan like you know did Things of like that are just class. Like that's what makes the club so special. The club game so special. But um, like we're saying, you know, like like fair play to a Lachlan. Like that's a that's, that's a huge win. Any senior championship is, but like to beat the All Ireland champions, like going for six in a row in Kenya as well, like uh, a savage win. Like really, you love to see your county men taking a game by the scruff of the neck, don't you? Really, uh, and yeah, Deegan did that. Even <laughs> like even just Owen Cody from a Valley Hale point of view, there were times there. And you, you talk about inter-county conditioning. There were times where he just took on balls. He, he gave a one to, I think it was with Niall Shortall, and you're just thinking, just, he was like, just stuck the chest down and was like, give me the yeah. ball. And that's what you want out, that's what you want out of your county lads. As I said, Hugh had a tough half an hour, um, but he came really thundered into in the second half. Pat Hoban described it to me after that O'Loughlin's, uh, and he wasn't, there was no sour grapes on like that. He just said O'Loughlin's were clinically cynical. And and they were, there was two or three times where it's like they made up their mind. I actually, we don't care how Valley Hill score as long as they don't score a goal from open play. And they pulled yeah. him down a couple of times. Paddy Deegan took uh, Owen Cody down. I think Hugh Lawler maybe took Owen Cody down as well. What do you think of that as well? It's probably a debate maybe for another day. But the rules are encouraging that type of thing really now at club level, aren't they? The, the punishment is not there. It's, it's actually worth your while to take somebody down. Yeah, so I, I remember it happened uh, in one of the underage games in Thurless I was doing with TG Cahar. Um, a minor game, actually. Uh, Nyland was running in on goal and one of the lads just cleaned him out from behind and he gets a yellow card. And you're kind of like, well, like you're making absolutely zero attempt to play the ball. So, you know, realistically, should it not actually be a red card? Like yeah. if you're making no attempt to play the ball and people say, ah, Jez, you know, he's only, he's only grabbing him and all this, but... It, it, there's a difference if you grab someone and pull his jersey right fair enough but when you run and tumble someone to the ground like a rugby tackle it's like that should be a red card like i'm sorry i think throwing the hurl at someone should be a red card as well in ice hockey if someone's going and, and somebody thro- fires a stick at you you get thrown out of the game immediately as well so i i don't see why that's not a red card either in hurling but i think i think uh the, the dragon lads down like it just rewards cynical well, cynical, right? It's dirty play, like, really, right? Okay, you might say, oh, that's smart. Because, look, the Shamrock did it to Dixborough. Your man was in a... Um, I can't remember off the top of my head now. The quarterfinal thing someone said on, on Twitter there was Dara Mason. Dara Mason. Uh, pulled your man down. Yeah, pulled him remember. down. Uh, it was the good centre forward for Dixborough. Um, uh, he, was wearing, he was wearing 11 the same day. I can't remember. But he pulled yeah, him down but, in the and, perfect And pulled place. him down, yeah, a, a step outside the 14-yard line. I remember the ref gave a penalty for us and then the umpire was like, no, he was actually outside. So then he gave a 21 yard free. And then that was the difference in winning and losing the game for the borough. Like, um, yeah. so I, I, I just don't like it. I would rather, yeah, see everybody play it. You know, we're playing the ball, play the man if you want, but, but not that. Like, it's not rugby, like at the end of the day. Like, I'm, you know, and I know people want to do whatever they can to win. You put in an awful lot into it. You know, you're, you're probably giving up your whole social life from January to now. And, you know, nobody in Lachlan's is going to care. They'll probably be all getting pats in the back for, for doing it up in the clubhouse. Like, but, just as far as the game is concerned, like and young lads growing up watching it and all, like we probably need to get rid of it. I think until there's a time where it's there's actually a deterrent that stops you from doing it. Like yeah, you like I, I said it to Shane. I'm on the previous shows. I remember I didn't do it in a game one time. It didn't actually enter my head. It's the last play of a game against Belmont in the quarter final, and you'd regret it ever since. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why you didn't pull that down. I didn't. And then two moves later, or two hand passes later, the ball is in the back of the net. Whereas you are, you, you're rewarded for it now. And until you're not rewarded, I think people are going to keep doing it. And managers and coaches are going to keep telling them to do it. Um, just a quick one here from Cody Novoraku. Uh, Varney, there was some belting uh, off the ball yesterday, wasn't there? Love seeing Paddy Deegan flake into own Cody. Same with Adrian Mullen and Butler flaking mad. Like, uh, Mikey Butler and Adrian Mullen were in each other's faces for 
65 minutes the whole way. Same with Hugh and Owen Cody. Um, same with Paddy Deegan and TJ at different times as well. And that's, to me, that's what it's all about. Because uh, at the end of the day, they're soldiering with those lads for county and they want to get their hands on the Bob O'Keefe and the, the Lee McCarthy for, for this time of the year. But when you draw a line in the sand, they will kill each other to get in yeah. on, you know, their hands in Kilkenny honours. It was the same, particularly, I think, with Adrian Mullen in the quarterfinal against Dixborough. He was probably, he was really, I would say, tar- targeted that day. Um, he's probably targeted a bit yesterday as well, but like it's an amazing, amazing thing from all options that they were able to keep Valley Hale to 19 scores. I think it was between uh, Owen Cody, Colin Fenley, TJ Reid, and Adrian Mullen. It was nine points from play. Like there are days where Colin Fenley scores two, three by himself. Yeah, from they play. Don't, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that was always it. Was always probably going to have to be something like that for all options to win. Um, just on Valley Hale, Nisha. Like this is the most incredible. Most extraordinary, you know, unbeaten championship knockout run is over now. You have to stretch back to the 2017 semi final against James Stevens. Like, if you look at how they reacted to that defeat, they weren't beaten in a knockout game in Kilkenny since. Where do you yeah. see them now? Tur- TJ is 36 next month. Colin's away and he's 34. Joey is 33 and he's traveling. Um, Pa Hoban emphasized to me yesterday that, you know, it generally take, take away one or two and it's a very, very young squad. He doesn't think they'll disappear. Where do you where do you see them over the next four or five years? Oh, they'll, they'll still be competing for championships, all right. And I mean, they went through they went through a kind of a transitional period um, while we were winning with Kula, which we were we were always actually kind of annoyed about when we were coming out. We were always hoping Bally Hale would come out and we get to play him. But he might have been, you know, he might went, have been annoyed, but you might you might have got to all Ireland medals. Well, but, like, that yeah, period. But, but like that was the thing. You, you, like they are just. This is the thing. Is like this is the kind of regard I would hold them in anyway. Like it's like that they were always and will be now the standard bear. And it's like there's a, there's a big difference between you know when when you beat the Shamrocks and you beat somebody else. Like it's a, it's a big deal. But I, they'll be around. They'll definitely be. Like I wouldn't be surprised if they came back and won it again against Kenny next year. Like I mean, you know, they got to a county final this year. They're beaten by a point. Uh, so I mean they're in the top two, three teams definitely, and will more than likely be you know you're talking about semi final final again next year at least. Um, I would imagine, uh, bec- and then because of the way the system is in Kilkenny, they can kind of you, you can kind of build it through the group. Like yeah. obviously you don't want to you know uh, some people think it's a stupid system, but I think it's the best system where every game matters, but you're never knocked out if you get me until you are knocked out basically. So I, that way they can kind of manage it. Um, if lads are traveling, you can come back for the real proper knockout stages and still win the championship. Um, so I, I, I'd i say they won't be too far off because they were missing an awful lot as well. You think about it, like you're missing Joy Hole, full back, right? Like, you're missing, you're missing um, the club player of the year. Like. They're yeah. missing was the best player in the championship last year. There you go. And Brian Cody still isn't really back, right? There's another really class club hurler. Uh, Darren Mullen as well, another class club hurler. There's three like a club level at the very very high end of club level you're missing the three of them right and then Colin is coming over and back that's not helping him either right so I, I'd say like I wouldn't be surprised to just win it again next year to be honest but like yeah, uh, yeah no harm in breaking the wheel I suppose the great teams um, like Kerry did in the football I know they were they, after 82 they were beaten in 83 by Cork and they came back and won three like, and Dublin did it in the football this year I'd be the same as you like, uh, like they were beating a point missing five of their best players I'd be very surprised if they're not back next year maybe things will be refreshed it'll, it'll be interesting to see just a, a left field comment in here and I'm just going to bring it up in case we forget it actually uh, uh, Colin Lyons Blindspot says well lads are we saying Turin to get the job done today a bank holiday Monday Connacht Intermediate Hurling Championship Turin against Four Roads because only chatting someone from Turin the other night it's absolute madness like I, why is it played on a bank holiday Monday I'll never know I'm sure you've had it at a club championship where maybe your game is fixed for Sunday evening in a long oh. weekend or, or and you're just you're waiting the whole weekend for it and everyone else especially, is probably enjoying themselves or whatever especially like um, let's say the Dublin County final yesterday was played under lights right on a Sunday night of the bank holiday where you kind of go why didn't we just play this Friday night under lights? Like, you know, if yeah. we want to play it under lights, why not play it Friday and give us the whole the whole weekend to enjoy <laughs> this or to or to drown our sorrows or whatever? But uh, Turin, yeah, that, that's brutal. Wait until Monday, I mean, holiday, like, right? Now it could be something to do with fields and the weather and all that. Who knows? But um, no, I fancy Turin now as well. They probably remember even last year as well. They probably should have won that intermediate club. Um, 
Yeah, no, I can't just win that. Yeah, 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 very, very probably very should have won that yeah, game. Yeah. And uh, I always, I, I always think it's a huge disrespectful thing that people always say, and they go like, "Oh, well, they're, they're great footballers, and they play with a football style." It's like, no, no, they have an awful lot of really, really skillful hurlers, and they play a nice possession game, and they have a nice brand and a nice style of hurling. So it'd be hard bet now, yeah. Today, no, I think I'd, I'd, I'd have them as favourites to win that, and yeah. Just a quick word on Brian Hogan, Nisha. Um, O'Loughlin's were beaten in the first round, I think, last year. Um, I think and Andy Comerford stepped aside after that. Like it's a fair turnaround. It's a fair turnaround in twelve months, isn't it? Really, like and like even just to get them to the stage where you believe down the home straight that you're going to win, where you you're going to keep going for the throat, even though it looks like the tide has kind of turned against you. There was a there was a free TJ miss, really uncharacteristic, about fifty six minutes. I actually was videoing it because it was like, oh, here's a handy thing to throw up on social media. A TJ read free or whatever. And he ended up missing it to to the far side, which was really really strange. And it almost seemed to spur all Octons on. Luke, e- uh, I think it was Luke Egan uh, or Luke Hogan came on and got a great point, and they got a point from Connor Kelly off the bench as well. The bench was huge too. They were on three men that all made an impact, but. It takes a fair, uh, it takes a fair amount of prep to get your team in that state of mind where against a great team who knows how to win in those stages, where you're gonna, you're gonna be the one that's pushing, you're gonna be the one that never stops, and you're gonna be the one pushing hard to the finish line. It's not a simple thing to to achieve. No, and then and then this is the thing with with I suppose from the Shamrocks point of view, where you have lads that would have usually been coming off the bench and making an impact are now all starting. So then who? When you go down to, the, to look at the bench, who can you really bring on to? Like, I remember against the Borough, they, were, they brought on Owen Reid. I mean, and you're kind of going, okay, yeah, class hurler, but if you're still relying on Owen Reid, it's like, you know, oh, geez, you're really kind of digging there. Whereas the Lachlan's, you know, you see how important the bench is, like how, how big of an impact you can have when you have three or four lads that can come on and actually make a positive impact, not be giving away frees and things like But That's it. Yeah, like, look. It's a huge turnaround, and 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 that generation of Kilkenny hurlers now. I, I I've been lucky enough now. I've been around some of them on like coaching at Eddie Brennan and 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 Herity especially, and they all have that exact same mentality, that exact same belief, and they really do make you feel like, because you know what, we we could actually beat anyone here now. We do this stuff, we beat anyone, and there's no, like I always love this again because like I grew up and it's kind of this was the attitude where. There was no messing. It was like it was basically. I thought like, you were going to say it was the attitude era. No, no. Well, that too, <laughs> that too. But like it was, it, it's basically a thing of like uh, you're either going to do the job, or you're not now, right? So you're either pulling, the, you're you're pulling here now, or you're not. You're either part of the solution, or you're part of the problem. And you know, you blow the whistle if someone's messing up and not doing the thing they're supposed to be doing. Bang there, and O'Loughlin's and Brian Hogan clearly have that attitude because to turn around from basically being non-competitive last in the champion in the championship. To win the senior county final in your first year as the manager, but not only win the senior county final, beat the All Ireland champions. Like it's it's as good as you're going to get. Right? It, it, it's just simple as that. Like it's as good as you're going to get. It, it, like Ballyhale, they're going for what so, All Ireland champions five in a row. Kilkenny champions, what won three All Irelands in the last yeah. four years as well, or something like it's it's as good a club team as you're ever going to face. And he beats them in their in their first year all together as one group. It's it's incredible, really. Savage. You just fly down through the scores really quickly. Mark Bergen, who was captain, he uh, finished with 10 points, uh, seven from place balls, found a good few pockets of play. Like Mark's very good at finding those areas and getting on the ball. He hit three points, um, missed a couple of frees uh, kind of towards the end. But like I thought he was thought he was very, very good, particularly on the ball. Jack Nolan got two early scores. Paddy Deegan got a boomer from about 110 yards at the start in the middle of the first half and then got that key score at the end. And did a lot of lads that chipped in. Shawnee Bulger got a point. Oh, Maul got a point off his hurl, I think. Connor Heary, who's someone I haven't mentioned, who I would know more as a defender, he was brilliant. He was like a, he was the, he's kind of like the out ball nearly at the edge of the square at times. He held up the ball really, really well. Connor Kelly came on and got a point. Uh, Luke Hogan got a point as well. And David Forward, he got that brilliant point. For Bally Hale, TJ ended up with nine, six frees. Again, like I, I'd always rate that performance in defeat as high as any performance in victory. I thought he was brilliant again. Aside from that free that you'd expect in the score, he was class. Owen Cody finished with three. Adrian Mullen, two. Colin Fenley, two. Funnily enough, Colin came out centre forward and caused Paddy Deegan a bit of trouble. He was just finding bit, little pockets of space. But inadvertently, that led Paddy to go forward at the end because Colin was falling back. And I'd say Paddy was like, oh, I'm going to take a chance here. And he ended up in the position. And it was funny. He was out near the sideline by the time he hit it. And I said to him after, like, 
even if he had to end up at the back of the stand, he was going to hit it off the left hand side. He was going to he was going to find space and work it off the yeah. left, wherever wherever way he could. Evan Shefflin had a point, Connor Walsh a point, and Owen Keneally a point as well. Um, and just a quick word from Pat Owen, the winning manager. After he just said. Uh, I just asked him if, if the Shamrocks are finished and he said, oh, Jesus, no. It'd be a foolish man to say it's the end of any Shamrocks team. Not at all. The age profile is very young. You'd be very surprised. But this club, you'll find in another two or three years' time, there'll be another two or three really good players coming into this squad. And that's kind of been the way. Owen Keneally came in. Killian Corkin came in. Niall Shortall came in. And they're all... Like, I think Killian Corkin's a deadly defender. I think it's... Mm. When, it's when he fills out a small bit more, he, I think he's... He'd be in around the he'd be in around the Kilkenny squad and even Dara Corkin playing a full back, which is an unusual probably position for him, thought he was very, very solid as well. So no, I don't think the Shamrocks are going anywhere, but uh it's O'Loughlin Gales' day and I, I believe the buff was in the clubhouse after some so no doubt there's plenty of content flying around on social media. But well done to everyone involved in O'Loughlin Gales. Um Nisha, you were down covering the Tipperary final, another belter of a game by all accounts, finished Kiladangan 121. Curtis Arsfield's 120. Just talk me through this game. Like, it, it wasn't a case of Kiladangan leading from pillar to post anyway, by all accounts. No, no. And, uh, like, Seamus uh, Kendi was saying there before the game as well, like, he was, um, that uh, Paddy Creedon was was thrown in to start and he, and he just pointed out, he goes, look, I actually love watching Paddy playing because all is on his mind is going for goal. First ball he got, he just ran, boom, and... <laughs> Last of the shot that went an inch inside the post, like it was class. Um, and they went, they went. I think, I think it was one five to a point down or something, something mad like that early on. And then they just, they got five points in four minutes or something, and they start just dragging and clawing, clawing back, clawing back. But it was, it was a, just a crazy game because Kildangan did all the hurling. Right, they were, they had. 50, I think at half time it said fifty six percent possession. I thought it was actually just just from watching. I was like, they must have around sixty percent. They had all the ball, but just like in the first games, well, some of their shooting is absolutely crazy. It's it, it's crazy. Like just it, like seventeen points, so, I think was. Oh yeah. my god! And it was ten in the first half, and not to mention like ones that are dropping short into the goalie and whatever. But like, and it, it's mad in the world because you have someone like Sean Hayes inside, and they're shooting from midfield, and you're kind of going, uh Come on, use him, use him, use him. But look, it was it was a fierce, it was a fierce, exciting game anyway. Because anytime Sean Hayes got the ball, much like Creedon on the other side there with with Hurlis, uh, he, he was just going for goal. I think he scored a goal in the point, but he probably could have had three one. Uh, like he he missed two. Now one was a very good save. It was kind of a half hook off Ronan and Mar as well. But he still got the strike away, and Paddy McCormick stopped it. It bounced and down low to his right hand side. It was a really really good save in the first half, and then his goal in the second half was just class. But um, I just thought a very strange thing now, uh, and actually I had highlighted him before the game, was uh, Stephen Cal at midfield, right, who had been brilliant all year, 17 points from midfield, which is incredible, right, all from play. The way he was linking up with Ronan Mar in the first day, in the first game, I don't know how many possessions he got, and he got three points, I think, from play again, and set up an awful lot of really good stuff. But then yesterday, they had him in the forwards, and Willie Connors, who basically was kind of between Willie Connors and Ty Gallagher, I think, were kind of tracking him and following him. So he just he kept getting crowded out and swallowed up there mm. because the way Horlis were set up with Connor Stakelham kind of dropping out to midfield so that Rowan Amar could kind of be free, uh, it was kind of swapping between then Joe Quigley and or James Quigley, sorry, and Joe Gallagher who were free then for Kiladangan. So then he was just swamped up and couldn't get on the ball at all. I'd say maybe maybe he handled the ball maybe four times, maybe something like that. For a fella that good and that effective, I just I, I don't know why they did that because there was no link then for Torless between half back to half forward because some of the stuff they were doing you're like okay but then they'd they'd completely go out of the game then for about ten minutes uh, like as I think at half time um, Torless only had one wide but it was like literally something like out of their nine scoring chances they had scored eight. Whereas then, okay. uh, Kill Killadangan, it was it was something crazy. Like out of their twenty-one scoring chances, they had ten, and I was kind of going, uh, "How do they think they're going to win the game doing this?" But they did. Like it was, it was just, it was one of the maddest games of hurling. Like real kind of open and ball bitten launched when you're kind of going, "Ah, oh, just run it, just you know, <laughs> and just driving it." And but it was uh, actually a fellow now I have to say was massively impressed with yesterday. Um, Alan Flynn obviously and Ty Gallagher midfield with Kildangan were, were were really good compared to the first day especially 
Um, but Declan McGrath, number seven there, wing back, was was really good. In the first half, he went up the field and he he was kind of between two minds. Will I shoot or pass? He ended up kind of half hitting this barely bad, timid, wide. And then every ball he got after that, he just passed it. And I was like, no, look, you're getting into the game, getting into the game. And then he gave Hayes the pass in the second half for the goal, which was, I was standing kind of behind him on the sideline. It, when I said through the eye of a needle now, it was through the eye of a needle. When the Torres Sarsfield's back jumped up, I to get his hurl over it. And I'd say it clearly his hurl by, but that much went past another fella, right into Hayes' hand, and he runs it in and finishes it, buries it in the corner. And then Declan Grass stood up then about maybe five minutes later, scored a nice, a lovely point himself. But he was excellent in the second half, I felt. Um, but the man of the hour, I suppose, had to be Willie Connors. Like he was everywhere. He was like an energizer bunny by running side to side in the half back line. I was kind of trying to figure out where he was playing for a long time. And then when the puck outs were going, and you know, when it was like kind of a set piece kind of a thing, he looked like he was standing at number seven at wing back. And Declan McGrath was actually pushed up into midfield with then Ty Gallagher kind of back into the half back line, helping out to swamp up or to kind of crowd out that area. So they were they were smart enough now with what they did because what Torres Arsfields were doing was they were kind of leaving two inside mostly all the time between uh, Owen Purcell and and Dara Stakelam and or then sometimes actually as well sorry Paddy Creed and Aidan McCormick was actually out in the wing uh, out wing forward but they weren't getting anything out of it because it was so crowded so then they were trying to go over so then the boys inside would have to win it and make a stick like you know like you were saying there with the Lachlans um, at this time of the year. There's very little more valuable than someone that can actually, you know, like you say in soccer, that can hold up the play. Like, oh yeah, if you can, if you can make it stick in the corner, so then the lads can run up and just even hold off a lad and then flick it out with your foot or something. But they, they weren't doing that. They couldn't do it. It was nearly coming out as quick. And then just, yeah, Willie Connors like was <laughs> he was epic. Like really, to be honest, he was absolutely brilliant. You'd have to be delighted for someone like him as well. Like I think it was when they lost to Kerry in that Munster hurling league game to start the 2022. That started off like a really bad sequence of injuries that he's had. Um, and like to, to go back, and we've seen him corner forward, midfield, wing forward, centre forward. He predominantly played in defence, I believe, kind of yesterday. It's funny, um, so some lads like that can do as much damage from a wing back position if they're standing up and striking kind of maybe from distance mm. as they can from corner forward. But um, Kiladangan now get to go in and represent Tipperary and Munster, which they didn't get to do the last time and I know that's the yeah. craw a bit because they were flying the last time as well how do you think that'll go they're obviously on there's no point in any different they're on the easier side of the, the Munster draw you have uh, Sarsfield's Ballygunner Sarsfield's are playing Ballygunner uh, next weekend I think and the winners play Napiershig and on the other side of the draw you have Clonlara and Kiladangan it's a great opportunity for the two of those and I'm, I'm sure Kiladangan when things settle down and puck on after four, five, six, seven days maybe. I'm sure I'm sure they'll regroup and fancy a good shot at that. And they will. It, it's kind of nice in a way that they didn't get to represent Tip the last time. They, that, that will bring them back down to earth after a couple of days, I'd imagine, because I'd imagine it's something they really want to go after. This is the thing. It, it depends on what, what you want as a group. Like, do you want to win? Do you want to win Munster or do you just want to see what happens? Like, it's like, uh, um, you know, we remember the, the so say the second year we went into Leinster with Kula, we we banned the phrase bonus territory, like was the oh, big yeah. thing. Like, like st- don't stop saying that. Like, you know, it's like let's try and win it. So like is that the attitude that they ha- that they'll have? Is that the mentality that they'll have going in? Um, if that is the mentality that they have and they do want to try and win it, I'd give them a great chance against Clonara because um like you were saying there with Willie Connors, uh, you know, playing a wing back, it was funny, like because he got two points where he was way up the field and we got a big long range boomer from 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 nearly the bridge like uh, just like in the replay or in the first game sorry um but he was popping up and they were they were creating nice overlap kind of off the shoulder runs between himself Declan McGraw and Flynn and Ty Gallagher like it was really good the way it was very hard to track who was marking who at times this was a thing it was it was fairly open and free flowing so if they play like that and just cut down the wides like it just like you know as they say you can't be doing that lad like it's just like <laughs> some of the some of the time you're like oh lovely they've worked it in and a lad is running to the sideline and he nearly has his back to the goal and the lad is trying to block him and he's shooting and you're going well, just use the ball turn back do something keep possession you've done great to work it up there and then you just spin and shoot like or something like, going, like so if they could because this is the thing if they tightened up their shooting yesterday should have beaten they'd have beaten Torres by about 10 points like um 
you know, two, two really good goal chances they missed. And then the, I, th- I think they hit 16 wide, probably dropped another two into the goalie's hands. So you're talking about, you know, leaving 14 scores behind you. Um, Is there anything getting... worse than dropping a ball into the keeper's hands? Because, because it boomed, wherever you hit it from, it's either going beyond your head or it's coming straight back to you. Um, so it's just, or it's passed out to somebody who's standing free who then scores from wherever, like, you know, so it's just, it, it's really disheartening. So like, if they tied it up that, they could actually be very dangerous. That, and that was the point I was trying to make before the game. Everyone was kind of saying, oh, you know, Torless, you know, I think Kiladang got away with it, Torless trying to win. Or less of in like I kind of thought he was like I don't know judging by the first game I thought Kildangan actually left that game behind him a bit because like that just some of their some of their decision making is funny which and again I was actually going to talk to somebody about this where that was a big criticism I had with Wexford for the last couple of years and Darry Egan is involved with both where they they were taking an awful lot of kind of pot shots from out way out the field where you're kind of going hey 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 like that's not the way the game has gone you know like it's like use it use it use it from fifty up rather than 50 back, you know, that's where you should be shooting. So I'd give them a good chance if they, if they tighten up that, they could be, they could be really dangerous because uh, I think Sean Hayes, as far as an inside forward, is as dangerous as, as you're going to get. He looks, uh, he looks in inter-county shape, doesn't he? Like he, he goes away from lads when he gets the ball. I just, I, the bits I've seen of him this year, saw him a couple of years ago, he's a good player, but he looks like he's gone kind of to another level. Like that's what you want from your county players. They pick up a ball and me and you are 50-50 and you're just going away from your opponent. Oh. Like that, to me, he looks like he, he has that kind of maybe inter-county potential. Yeah, yeah. He, he eats up the grass when he runs like, yeah. and when lads are chasing him, you just the gap just goes, uh, you know. Um, so yeah, he's very, very dangerous. But they just they need to feed him way more. Like they just, you know, they just need to feed him way more. And actually, strangely enough, Billy Seymour then like Paul Flynn was actually quiet enough yesterday because he was brilliant in the first game, but he was quiet enough mm. yesterday. Um, and Billy Seymour missed a couple of frees which he wasn't doing. Now one, he had got a bang in the head and he got up and took the free. So like that's always a dodgy one. But yeah. again, like they're the kind of things tighten them up, tighten that stuff up. They they could be fairly dangerous now and could give it to Flanlara, but. I mean, whoever comes through the other side, like, you know, you're talking about potential all Ireland champions between Valley Gunner and the Piersig, and then who knows what kind of prep Cork Sars are having with the weather and all, um, if they're going to be hampered or not. So, um, yeah, it'll be tough now. And, and, and again, sorry, like, with, with a county lad playing club level, look, Willie Connor is the very same. You know, how many times yeah. have you seen him? You know, he's getting kind of thrown around the place with tip and they don't know where to play him. But then when you watch him playing with Kildang, you're like, all right, okay. I see why he's in there. I see why he is continually getting played. Like he just, he was, like I said, he was like an energizer bunny yesterday. Like he was everywhere. He was up and down the field. He was back in the half back line. He was coming up to hit sidelines then running back. Like he was, he was really good. Very like, actually, I know I mentioned lads in Waterford, but who used to be like that uh, with Mount Sion in Waterford was Owen McGrath. Like we'd kind of be like, you'd be looking at him at Waterford and going, you know, he'll get a couple of points here and there, but then you see him playing with Mount Sion, you'd be like, oh my God, like, he's uh, he's brilliant. Like, he used to be yeah, fast yeah. in Mount Sion, but I love, I love seeing lads like that playing just savage with the club. Um, like that, Willie Connors, though, just, I couldn't really, honestly, say enough about how good he was yesterday. But, tactically, they probably need to tidy it up a bit. I don't think they can play the way they played. If they do end up, let's say, meeting Ballygunner and a Piershig in, in a Munster final, let's say, now if they beat Flanara, I think, tactically, they'll have to be a bit Cuter and smarter and be far better with use of possession. A couple of varying opinions on how that uh, Munster semi final is going to go. Richard Murphy says Kilidangan should beat Clan Lara to make the Munster final, and Parik Ryan or someone else quickly came in and said, Can't see Kilidangan beating Clan Lara. That's what we love about the GA. Clan Lara are a much more balanced team. Don't know how Kilidangan uh, stopped the goal trade. Yeah, it's going to be, going to be, going to be, uh, that'll be a fascinating game in fairness. Just a quick word, Nisha, before I let you go. I know you didn't see too much of it. Uh, but the Dublin final that was played yesterday, like, I don't think anyone really thought it was going to go the way it did to that extent. To finish Nafina 2-19, um, uh, Bally Bowden St. Enders 9 points. Like, to win your first county title after the heartbreak of 2021, extra time, and last year by 3 points. Like, how emphatic do you get? And without Donald Burke. Without Donald almost, Burke. It's almost like lads have grown a foot or something in the last six or seven weeks without him and just stood up. It's like, what a... What a performance for the biggest day. What a way to win your first. Oh, class. Like, it was class. And like, it just, I, I was only thinking like when I came home last night, I was like, why didn't I go into the bookies? Like, I was like, stunned. Like, I was like, I would have had a lock in Skildang and, and the Fiend as well. Like, was I at? But anyway, 
I fancied Nafina, but I did, like you're saying, I didn't think they'd win by that much. I didn't think it'd be that big of a gap. And remember, you were kind of referencing earlier talking to Brian Hogan um, about when you get a feeling about a club, and you're kind of like, oh, remember during the year, it was kind of at the end of the summer, maybe, or in September, I'd been talking to Colin Burchill, and I'd ask him, oh, how are you doing, you know, with Hope Dolan and this and that, and you know, who's on the freeze, and like, oh, how's it going? And he says, no, no, we're going very well now. And just the way he spoke, I was kind of like, you know, they, they fancy winning this because I think oh, actually sorry it was it was on the run into the cross game and I was kind of going you know be tough now against cross he says ah, yeah it will but sure I mean look sure you're gonna have to beat them at some stage if you want to win it and I was like true and then just when the way the conversation went I was like it is that fancy they're gonna win they're gonna yeah. beat cross you get a vibe and, and win sometimes it. off that yeah. don't you you get a bit and of I a was, vibe yeah and that, that that was obviously he was um portraying that to the players as well and players start believing that and they can feel how it's going as well you know what I mean. Oh, 100 percent and then like it's just it just like you're saying like it's just a great way to win it and then Joe I, I say if you're an Athena player there when and actually another lad sorry I'm delighted for uh Liam Rush like right come back from Australia could have done all the traveling and the amount of times he's been so close and for a player that good and like a Dublin player to be that good for for as long as he has been and the injuries he's had and this and that that he finally know you're kind of going like yes you know, this is this is something that I can look at and, and, and hold and really be like, no, 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 ideally he'd probably prefer to have done it with Pat's parents down, but they've had issues and whatever. Um, but look, what a win for him. But I, I always loved <laughs> if you were in a county final and you ended up pulling away that the last kind of five, ten minutes when you know the yeah. game is won, you know what I mean? And you kind of go, this is, you're kind of looking around going, this is actually class. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is deadly. So like, you know, it's great. And uh, it's great to see, look, Donald Burke going up and lifting the cup. And I know he's probably delighted for the lads, delighted for the club and all, but he must be kind of itching to get back as well. And I did hear that he is doing a bit um, already, that depending What's on how the far What's the nature of the injury, uh, Nisha? It's the hamstring injury, sure, from the county game against Clare, I think, isn't it? Oh, yes, he, yes, I, that, yes, that, that yes. I'm, I'm fairly sure it kind of was kind of more serious than they originally thought. And just, um, he's been out since then. Like, he hasn't played with Nafina. Uh, he's been out since then. So that was the kind of thing. I was like, God, that'll be a huge blow. But like, I mean, they just went to win the county championship for the first time ever without him. So yeah. um, it's funny, like, because Leinster, is, is, Leinster really is wide open. Um, it, it, it just has been blown open with the Shamrocks losing. Um, I, I think any team, basically Leinster, can beat any team now going forward. Nafina have as good a chance as any team to win Leinster, I think. Um, Nafina, Nafina, as well. play who? Nafina play who, Nisha? I actually don't know what the draw is. I haven't it's, looked at it yet. Cam, Camros versus Nace in a quarter final. Can Conrad play Nevena? O'Loughlin's play. O'Loughlin's go to Mount Leinster Rangers, I think. So who's left? Uh, I'm actually not sure who's left. Nafina play. Oh, sorry, they're playing. Nafina are playing. Um, uh, Rat, uh, Thingamajig from Westmead. Uh, oh, Raharney. Okay. Sorry, Raharney. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Rah- like there's some opportunities right. there. Like all all eight teams will fancy their chances, like big time, hundred percent they will. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's the thing with like with the Leinster Club Championship, because uh, there's so many counties at the senior grade. It's such a long club championship. Like if there's you know there's three more games you have to win like just to get out of Leinster whereas like in Munster you might only have to win two let's say yeah like it it makes it or like say the Galway Champions just come out and they're in the All Ireland semi final or Ulster you might only have to play one you know so it's like it's a it's a drag and it's a slog and going down to Carlow or going down to Wexford Park you know or, or bringing somebody to Parnell Park and you just you hate going to these places and it's freezing and you know it's just it's class, like it is. It is deadly, but it's it, it's wide open. I think this year, it's probably. And I said this to you before. Obviously, probably I think it was before the quarter final in Kilkenny. Even I said it to you that if Shamrocks don't come out of Kilkenny, I actually have a slight favouring for Nace to run the Leinster Championship this year. Depending on where they are now, if they bring them back into Crow Park and all again, I'd give them a really good chance. But if it's all home and away fixtures, I don't know what way it's laid out. If it's all home and away fixtures, it'll be a bit tougher. But I think if they're brought to Pro Park for like the semi-finals and final. Uh, I think I think Nace have a I think Nace have a good chance. Cuckoo has just said who he's calling for Leinster champions. You've kind of called it. It's a it's a very tough one to call. Um, I think O'Loughlin's aren't going to concede much in any games they play. Uh, with the strength of their defence and the heavier the ground gets, I think 
Like they're going to be, they might concede maybe 114, 115 in games. I don't see them con- when the ground gets really heavy. I don't see them shipping big scores. So, and they've generally gone well in Leinster any time they've come out with Kilkenny. He beat them obviously in 16. They went to the All Ireland final year. They were beaten by Claren Bridge. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep my nails or my uh, I'm gonna keep my yeah I'm gonna keep my nails to the O'Loughlin Gales mast. I think they'll go on. Just really quickly, Nisha, you're talking about Liam Rush there. I was chatting him last Thursday. I just chanced my arm to see what he take a call last week. And in fairness, he did. This is the year he's had. He was he's been swimming with dolphins in Kaikoura in New Zealand. He's been swimming with. Leopard sharks and bull rays in, in Byron Bay. He uh he did ma- he went up in, to the Sun Gate in Machu Picchu in Peru at three or four in the morning, climbing through go through the jungle. He travelled around New Zealand for six weeks in a camper van and then he wins a county medal. Like he's only home about six weeks and he has a county medal in his back pocket. It's sometimes it's gas sometimes when you've put in all the work over about 15 years. You, you think you maybe need to be at every session or whatever. Sometimes it just falls into place. He's back six weeks. Someone got injured. He went in centre back. They probably weren't ex- the, a lot of people weren't expecting to beat Crokes. Some people weren't expecting to beat Luke, and and then you end up with a county title. Like it's it's nuts the way it works out sometimes. Yeah, it's class and and, and similar to Will O'Donoghue in the Pearshick as well. He doesn't play since the All Ireland final. Slots in, plays the whole hour, and it's just like oh okay, but <laughs> yeah, like that you know. Maybe sure he was on some kind of a vision quest in Machu Picchu. Maybe he was drinking ayahuasca like Aaron Rodgers there below in Peru. And who knows what he saw. Maybe he saw all this coming. Uh, but yeah, interesting fella, Liam. Yeah. And uh, no, I'm delighted for him because like it is. And they've been so close now. Like that's three county finals in a row. And a lot, of, a lot of people in Dublin have been kind of waiting for this because they won an awful lot of under 21s in a row. Um, and and people, people have been kind of taping them for a long time. And now finally it's it's coming through and and again like just from my job as well there's there's so many lads pushing hurling there and they've been pushing hurling for so long and it's like it's not just like the players now would have won it it's like everybody in the club and even Finton there in the truck with us strategic air like you know he's like last year so I, I'm on the commentary and I have him in my ears and he's pucking every ball like you know his brother's <laughs> playing in the field and he's shouting and going oh god yes, you know and I'm there kind of trying to concentrate myself and all and but. Uh, it's it, it's a real it's a real whole club victory like Nafina winning the hurling. So yeah, fair play to Liam and and uh Don I know will probably be sick sick enough if he missed it. Uh but look for the club, it's brilliant. And a and a new club, again, an north side team as well, I suppose. Actually, sorry, that's the first time in a very long time an north side team has actually won the Dublin Hurling. Crave Championship. since Crave Care on, I think. Yeah, yeah in two thousand and six, yeah. yeah, like which is which is mad, which is a kind of a mad stat. Um and actually sorry, speaking of mad stats. Uh, yesterday again, the tip final for the third year in a row, the team that scored the equalising point in the first game won the replay. Yeah, it is. That Which, that uh, is that that is a man. Weird, one. weird one. Yeah, yeah. Nisha, you've been brilliant with your time. Actually, you're just no going matter. to bring in. Are you going to bring in a TG TG four colleague? Oh, we have two, we have two boys here. Mark, 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 Mark Foley. Nisha, also, Mark, 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 Right. Boys, you could have a conversation there, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what is going on at all. But Nisha, thanks very much. You've been brilliant with <laughs> no your matter. time. Good luck, guys. Go on. Thanks a million. Thanks, man, Nisha. Nah. Mark, how are you? Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Very good. Very Great, good. Thanks. Um, Great. Great. You were on duty with TJ Carr on, on Saturday evening, Mark. Um, a very, very good final. Very, very high quality uh, game. Finished uh, Napierschik 120, Patrick Swell 19 points. Just break down the game for me and what was the winning and losing of it. Well, I, I think to be fair, Patrick Swell did very well to stay in the game. I think uh, for 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 long stages in the game, the Pearsley were you know were a good bit better. I think Patrick Swell just managed to cling on in there uh, against their own play really because I suppose we were doing the uh, the bit of uh, stats afterwards. I think the Pearsley created probably maybe six or seven clear cut enough goal scoring opportunities and only managed to take one of them. And uh, now Patrick Swell created a few in the first half as well, and and uh, just before half time, uh, Shane Dowling made uh, made a good save from uh, Kevin O'Brien. But other than that, I think the Pearsley were probably just a little bit better. And I suppose it, it came down to again, you know, much commentary before the game about Patrick Swell's three big players. Uh, I think the Pearsley did a good job on uh, on that, and probably maybe helped a bit by the the structure that uh, Patrick Swell used as well by putting like the modern game is probably easier to man mark a guy middle of the field than it is at centre forward. So maybe I suppose ret- retrospectively. Maybe Keen Lynch, I suppose, if he was centre forward, might have been a bit more difficult to manage. But uh, I think that played into the Pearsons' uh, hands a little bit. Conor Boylan did a good job on Keen middle of the field, I think. Uh, and um, 
that enabled them. There was probably a player from both sides in the half forward line drifting into that middle third, and it allowed William O'Donoghue William to sit back in front of Aaron Galan. Uh, and they were able to cut out that link between Dermot Burns uh, and Aaron Galan as well and kind of stifled Keane Lynch as well there. So that was kind of the story of the game. Uh, I think the Pearship were probably a, a good bit more value for what they actually won by, but uh, credit Patrick well really for staying in the game when when at times they looked to be beaten in a lot of positions all over the field. So, yeah, Patrick well, you know, the Pearship rather will be very, very, very happy with with their their victory because um they've introduced a number of younger players there this year and and uh, they'll be they'll be delighted to get over the line with uh, which is essentially probably a team nearly in transition at this stage you know great interview with Connor Boylan um on TJ Catter after where he basically said his old fella came in and reddened him a half time <laughs> can you talk us talk us through that I don't is, is his old fella involved in the club or did he just come in was he did he come in rogue and say this lad needs to buck up no Dave is actually uh, he, his dad is actually the doctor with Napier again he was a doctor okay. with us with Limerick for years a great great gm and dave actually won championships with uh with middleton uh back in the 80s so you know all the boylan's dave boylan michael boylan his brother they were great players uh for middleton back in the back in the 80s and uh i think dave initially when he came to limerick was involved with Lahan, but obviously um he settled out in cardavan where uh napier are based and uh the young the, his young lads didn't, didn't play like i suppose Jerome as well, Connor's brother, he'd be a big loss for Napier Sheik. Uh, he mm. wasn't available. I think he did his cruise shit as well. So, uh, yeah, those two lads are huge, uh, huge additions for uh, for Napier Sheik. Uh, Connor was excellent, especially in the second half, I thought, when he really opened up in the, in the second half the last day. But uh, but basically, I suppose, Dave, I suppose, been wearing the doctor's hat maybe on the sideline, but I suppose the, the, the dad's hat maybe uh, and the selector's hat maybe in the... Um, in the dressing room at halftime, just may, maybe told to Connor maybe to get stuck into Keane a little bit more, which he did. And I think in the second half, did a right ding dong battle. And I suppose any time you kind of limit Keane's um, uh, contribution from play, it's seen as a, a huge plus. And and that was the case for Napier Sheik. And Connor really took the fight in the second half. And I suppose showed maybe something that maybe a lot of people mightn't be aware of. He showed a real turn of pace when, like any big fella, once he got over that four or five, first four or five yards. He was able to take off then and he was very impressive in the second half in setting up scores for maybe some of his colleagues in the half and full forward line after that. Uh, like Connor Boylan's another fella that probably had limited game time with Limerick this year, but another fella that that's there and kind of tre- like remember he got a great point at the end of the 2022 All Ireland final. Like he's still there, right. still still trying to to yeah. m- make a kind of make a place for himself. Now I'd say you you said his dad gave him a few words of encouragement. Now I'd say it might have been a, li- a little bit more than that <laughs> potentially. He might have read him a small <laughs> bit, but it it, it definitely yeah. it definitely worked either way. Just on some of the jewels, uh, Mark, Mike Casey. And Aaron Galan, I think Aaron had something like 765 tallied up coming into the final. He got two, but you take that every day of the week from an appearance point of view. He was held to an extent anyway, and you'd have to you'd have to credit Mike Casey for the job that he did on him. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and I suppose if you look at the structure and the way the um the, the match played out, uh Kimalik did something similar in the semi-final. Uh, it didn't work for them because they were, there wasn't enough pressure on the, on the ball going into the, the, the Patrick's well full forward line the last day. And there's nearly a direct link between either Dermot Burns and Keane Lynch and Dermot Burns and Aaron Galan. Uh, and that's what the Pearson tried to try to upset, which they did. I think any time Dermot Burns got on the ball, they were all you know all over him, two or three players on him and putting him under massive pressure. So he wasn't able to get that head up and, and pick out uh, Aaron Galan with that kind of diagonal ball in around the edge of the square. Uh, and as well, just the structure and sending the likes of Jack Keller out towards the, the middle of the field, even though he did very well, uh, it enabled William O'Donnell to sit back in front of Aaron, uh, Aaron and, uh, you know, sometimes... In my case, his job was very, very straightforward. It's just get that ball to ground, which he did. And then the likes of Kyle King, who was excellent, and the likes of William O'Donnell, who was excellent, they just cleaned up every single one of those, and they worked the ball up the field after that. So, uh, yeah, I think the Pearson had the homework done, I think, in the second half. Kevin Downs did a lot of damage. Uh, right half forward in the first half, um, left half forward in the second half, and drifted around the place, and such was his uh, dominance in the air, especially from, you know, pr- you know from, from, from pro coats and that. That sometimes Dermot Burns was forced to, forced to mark him out the wing, and when that happened, then Shane Downing clever enough put the ball down the opposite wing. So they did a good job yeah. of keeping the ball away from Dermot. And every any time he got the ball, then they were forcing him all the time onto his left hand side. And uh, I think that was that had a big bearing in the way the the, the way the um, the match went. But uh, yeah, certainly um, 
It was a very good final. Mightn't have been the spect spectacle people were looking for because I suppose when you have that extra body from both sides in the middle third and have an extra defender on either side, then it probably doesn't lend itself to a, an outstanding spectacle. But nonetheless, it was a, a hugely physical and uh, entertaining, tactically and uh, an, an entertaining battle as well. Mark, I talked with Nisha earlier about, let's say, Mikey Butler and Adrian Mullen getting to know each other and all Cody and Hugh Lawler getting to know each other. There was a couple of saucy enough moments between county teammates at different stages during the game as well, wasn't there? Absolutely. And I suppose, like, I'd have no problem with that because basically what it shows is that, you know, that the bite and the drive and the desire is there to win and get over the line. And, and obviously hurling is a very physical game. It's becoming more and more physical over the last few years because... I suppose just looking at like the Conor Boyne and after the match, like when you get up close to these guys, geez, they're they're they're, they're huge physical specimens. Like and you're they happy not to be chasing them around. You'll be happy not to be chasing them around at wing back. <laughs> well, I, don't, I, don't, I was never good for chasing anyone around anyway. So I I, I suppose yeah, and definitely now looking at some of these guys, um, yeah, they're in they're in serious serious shape and they're able to use themselves as well. Uh, and I think you know from maybe an old school type values um it's good to see that because it upholds the integrity of the club which is central really to the association and it's a great month the month of october county finals I and mean, you see lads you know who are companions and teammates all year inter at, on the inter-county stage getting stuck into an, one another and uh, and really going for it that's what the public want to see you know they want to see real drive real passion and uh, and and players kind of putting everything on the line and uh you know that's 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 what makes the uh these championships so special you just fly through the scores really quickly. Ronan Lynch had eight points from the Pier Street seven frees. Peter Casey got that all important goal. You mentioned Kevin Downs, he ended up with four points. Connor Boylan, David Dempsey, two each. Um, they were the main scorers. Patrick's well, Aaron Galan, seven points, five frees. And uh, Dermot Burns was limited to two frees, like as you see there. And it's probably something um county teams would look at. Like I remember when Tip played Limerick in 2022, and it was a tip side that were going poorly. But it was similar. They didn't let Burns dominate the game. They tried to bring him back on. His left side is, is fine, but it's not, you know, 120 yard clearance off his right. So I thought they were they were very smart uh, in that the other night. We have to have a word on on Will O'Donoghue, though, Mark. Yeah. Um, he he tore his plantar fascia after three minutes of the All Ireland final. Somehow managed to play another 68 minutes, basically on one leg. He said he was hardly able to walk at half time. Um, he was in New York with, with his girlfriend a week later. I think he said he walked the length of Manhattan without knowing what was wrong with him. Um, he didn't have to undergo surgery, but he was told he'd be out between 12 and 16 weeks. And he made it back for an appearance one day shy of the 14-week mark. And like, to do what he did, to do what he did uh, in the game, given the lack of game time, is outstanding. Really, like he's a bit of a he's a bit of a force of nature. I I don't, and I mean this in the best way possible. I don't think he's well liked by opposition uh, uh, opposition spectators, but he's the sort of player that you want on your team every day of the week. Uh, and he was just he was brilliant again the other night. Yeah, to be fair, and and probably maybe a. Uh... Maybe a position that probably doesn't suit him. I'm not talking about centre back now, but the, the way the game played and being that loose kind of man, he's probably not his forte kind of getting on the ball and protecting space. I think the job he does with Limerick is massive. Uh, and obviously, he has the attributes, the physical attributes, number one, but like a really, really mentally tough guy as well. Um, so he's a huge, a huge player for Limerick going forward. And obviously, I think Declan, uh, Declan Hannon has done a massive job there at centre back uh, for Limerick over the last number of years. But I suppose, look, the way the game has gone, you see that the teams that have had success against Limerick are the teams that push up, which require a guy to really hold the middle and play a more traditional centre-back role because the game is kind of evolving all the time. Like Teams are starting not to allow you to have the plus one anymore to play the ball through the lines, and the pressure is coming higher up the field now. And for that, you need a guy who's able to, to hold the ground. Use the ball, obviously, uh, when they do get it. But um, but like William O'Donnell who is a, is a real real um, leader and a physical presence. Uh, he's done a great job at midfield, and maybe he might be there again next year in the middle of the field in terms of, you know, chasing players and hunting players down. And you'd see the the the, the kind of marquee players in the middle of the field that Limerick have faced over the last few years. William O'Donnell picks them up all the time. He does a job on them. Mm. Um, so he's a massive player for Limerick, massive player for the Pearshick, and uh, fair play to him the other day. You know, put his um put his body on the line again and wasn't 100% fit but came through with, with flying colours so as you say a huge force of nature but a, a huge character as well really really strong guy in the dressing room I'd imagine and uh, his performances for the Pierce and Limerick over the last few years have been outstanding 
Just a couple of quick comments in there. Richard Hogan just said David Dempsey played a key role in winning a lot of dirty ball for uh, yeah. Napierce. He can probably play maybe a different type of role than he played in other years where he was yeah. that kind of ball, ball winning forward. He's definitely been out around the middle a lot more this year, Mark, hasn't he? Yeah, he has, but I, I think even going back now, and I've watched a lot of these players all the way back from 14, 15 years of age, he kind of has trouble Dermot there at times under 21 that played McConaughey final over in Brough and uh, has troubled him as well. Like, I've great time for David Dempsey. I think he's a fantastic player. He reminds me a lot of kind of one Larkin in the role he used to do there when he was with Kilkenny. When he played left half forward there the other night, he, you know, the Kitogs, he can come in and across and catch the ball over and turn mm. on, on the side where he's facing goal, and he's very good at that. But I think ultimately what he did show the other night, he was very good, but it showed that maybe Patrick Swell didn't have the strength in depth. They had maybe three or four players maybe that, that Napierschik exploited. And sometimes over the last few years, some of the, the county finals Napierschik have won, the guys who've got man of the match would have been the guys that would have been on the weaker players on the opposition. Okay. And uh, Napierschik really had the um, had probably a little bit more strength in depth than the well. The well were relying on the maybe three or four uh, of the bigger players. Uh, and I suppose Napier, she goes, was strength and depth wise, just had it over them. And the likes of David Dempsey and the likes of Peter Casey, they, they tend to move around and maybe try and exploit maybe one or two of the opposition. And I think that's the way it worked out at the weekend. David Dempsey caught some great ball in the first half. And again in the second half, himself and Kevin Downs, I think they were excellent from puck outs. I thought Shane Dowling was excellent in the goals as well, as Jason Galan was for Patrick Swell. Really, really good. Um, but yeah, David Dempsey, huge player for uh, for for, uh, for Napier, she again. Probably unlucky not to be on the Limerick panel. I feel he's good enough probably to be there because he's an intelligent player, used the ball, uses the ball very well, even set up two goal scoring opportunities from his use of the ball and panel it on to other guys. So yeah, he's a massive player and will be in the Munster Club campaign for Napierschig as well. And that's the thing about Napierschig. You go to five or six lads that could be on a Limerick panel and aren't Rot Ronan Lynch, Kevin Downs, David Dempsey, Adrian Breen, like lads that would be on any other county team. And I suppose that's a lot to do with the strength in Limerick at the minute. Just fly through another few comments quickly. Uh, River Power says Limerick's out and out best players are one to nine, and that was proved again on Saturday night. The Shellmanator just says Willow D could play for South Africa. He I, he's uh, he's just that that sort of physical abrasive player. He actually said after the other night. Basically, on your point, he doesn't like playing that sitting role. He likes to get in, involved in the exchanges. He likes to get involved in the play. That's kind of what he feels suits him best. But he was he yeah. was fine in that role the other night. P well seventy four uh, is probably um, a bit sick this morning. I'd say, but but, but judging by his name anyway, uh, the well being physical and getting involved in off the ball stuff as well as playing an extra defender didn't suit them. And uh, Richard Hogan just says Nap will fancy another cut at Munster, especially Bally Gunner if they come through. Could easily have won the corresponding fixture last year, uh, but shot a few wides at crucial stages. Yeah. How do you see? Um, do you like it's funny going into the final? Napierschik fell over the line against Dune and delivered yeah. a very good final performance. Patrick's well blew Kilmallock away and maybe underperformed in the final. Do you think there's another gear or two in Napierschik? And like they had Bally Gunner in trouble for 40 45 minutes in that game down Gaelic grounds, um, last year. Like, do you think do you think there's a potential that they could maybe turn them over if they if they play to a high level in that game? If it providing obviously, um, Bally Gunner get through Sarsfields this weekend. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I think the Bally Gunner Sarsfields game is going to be fascinating. I think John Cronin has done a good job there. Dermot O'Sullivan is, is coaching them. I think they you know came through a very very tough campaign in Cork and they drew the first game against Kent Turk like and it didn't look like things were going to plan, but they really came back after that and had a great. Great campaign, a great win against the McKinley in the semi-final, and then they turned over Minton in the final with a great second half performance. So I don't think that's the foregone conclusion people are, are, are inclined to say it is. I think it's going you're to be You're obviously good involved, contest. Mark. You're involved with Charleville, weren't you? Like you know the Cork, I, uh, you know you know the you know the Cork um scene inside out. So you know yeah. that you know how good Sarsfields are. Yeah, like they've been knocking on the door and they've been probably favourites for the last three or four years to win the championship. Um, plenty of players and obviously with Sarsfields, they, they always have a few imports as well, which strengthens their case. But, uh, you know, if Sarsfields hit a day where things go right for them, they have they have the potential to really put it up to Belly Gunner. And I think that's going to be a right ding-dong battle. It's going to be just interesting to see what, what way they approach Belly Gunner because it's not straightforward playing Belly Gunner. Um, I think there ha there is going to have to be an element of a, of a press involved that puts pressure on them high up the field, which limits the supply going into the likes of Desi Hutchinson, who realistically who gets the ball if he gets the ball at that level, um, you're going to you can nearly put it down as a score. But uh, yeah, I suppose further down the line, if Belly Gunner did get over that, the Pierce would be eyeing, eyeing it up definitely, no, no doubt about it. I I probably think 
the championship in Munster is probably all about now looking at the teams that have come through what stage are Bally Gunner at? Are they, are, are they at the level they were last year and even two years ago? Um, I thought they were excellent last year. And that match you mentioned between the Piercing and uh, Bally Gunner last year was probably one of the best club hurling matches mm. I've ever seen, such was the quality. And it was, a, you know, it was akin to an inter-county game. Um, are the Piercing uh, equipped to take out Bally Gunner? Hard to know. I don't think they're at the level they were three or four years ago. I don't think they're as strong as they were. But I think they are coming into form at the right time. They were poor against Dune, but I think there were mitigating factors there. I think, look, the championship in, in, in Limerick, it looks like Dune had a lot of injuries this year, but it looks like, you know, with the four teams that made the semifinals at full strength, they're just a little bit ahead of all the other teams there at the moment. So I think Napier, she kind of lost their first round against Patrick's well. Weren't great uh, early on in the championship, but they knew they were going to get to the semifinals. So their semifinal against Dune, was their first champion, real championship match they've had mm. since the game against Benny Gunner last last year. So look, there was an element of rustiness and getting dirty, dirty petrol out of the way. But I think after that, I think they were going to be a different proposition in the final. And that's the way it turned out to be. I think, you know, the longer that the game went on, the more they found their feet. And I think they're going to be in good shape, whoever they meet uh, the next day. Interesting one at the end, uh, Mark, rather than Shane Dowland poking the ball down and the ball potentially ended up in the edge of their square, he poked it about 120 yards out over the far, out over the far sideline and their yeah. whole team sat back. And mm. it was a tactic Shane O'Neill actually used when Galway beat, was it Tipperary, I think, in all our quarter final yeah. or, or qualifier in 2000. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, like it's, he said it about it's kick to touch. Like you talk about yeah. like how, thing, how things have changed. Who would yeah. have ever thought put, putting the ball out of play would be to your advantage? Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, we've seen it before, like from, from Shane and, and and that Galway game against Tip. But, uh, you know, I, I think at that stage of the game, field position, you know, as the saying, rugby is is, is very hey, important. Hey, be careful about bringing in too many of them terms now. I shouldn't have said kick the touch now either. <laughs> yeah. Well, having, having the ball down the far end of the field and have your players set up defensively, I think, is is, is important. And then if you win the ball, you're, you're, you're going to, because the, the opposition have to push, push on, you're in ideal territory to catch them on the counter attack from a turnover. So I think, look, that's the way the game is going. The game of hurling is now based on turnovers, and uh, if you can be properly set up um, to, to to turn over a team and break into that space, that they, when they have to push on, I think it's uh, it's something that uh, Napier Sheik were right to, to 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 do the other night. So you know, uh, fair play to them. And uh, the more the more it evolves, the more this you'll kind of see uh, you'll see different managements come up with these kind of plans and so on and so forth. Couple of quick questions just to finish, Mark. Um, Jason Gallan, I've been very impressed with anything I've seen of him this year. Nicky Quaid is obviously, uh, you know, he's going to retire in the next three to four years potentially, or maybe yeah. he'll stay going <laughs> and defy father time, maybe like Stephen Cluxton. And um, Barry Hennessy obviously retired. Hmm. Is there a is there a spot for him there as sub goalkeeper or third goalkeeper? Could he be the next Limerick keeper in time? Well, he, Jason was actually on the panel, I think, two years ago. That's right, uh, yeah. He might have been all in the middle or two. Uh, he definitely has one anyway. And, uh, like, Jason did a lot of his hurling up to a couple of years ago in the forwards, even though he yeah. played with Limerick under 20s in goal. So he has the hurling, no doubt about that. He's a fantastic striker of the ball. And what he showed the other day, that on top of that, he's a great stopper and he's brave. The first save he made against Peter Casey at that top was an excellent save because Peter Casey did everything right. You know, if you're coaching any young lad, he did exactly as you'd, you'd want him to do. Shorten the grip in the hurley, hit it into the ground, but Jason Galan managed to get his feet. But the second one's probably more straightforward against Adrian Breen. But yeah, certainly he has all the necessary qualities to make it. And we're looking in Limerick with Nicky, obviously. He's been absolutely phenomenal over the last number of years. But, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure the lifespan of goalies is a lot longer than an outfield player, so I don't expect Nicky to be going anywhere anytime soon. But Jason Galan certainly is, is well more than capable, I think, of ste stepping up. And you have other options there as well. I think Jamie Power from One Lean is there, and Connor Hanley Clark was from, from Kilmallock was uh, was there um, with the under 20s last year, and he's an exceptional talent as well once he applies himself. So look, I, I think we're well set in, in the goals anyway, uh, coming down the over the next few years. Mark, I promise now I didn't I didn't tee up this comment here. Richard Hogan says, if only Joe Quaid could have hit the ball as far as Dowling did back in 94, things could have been different. It's funny, like, because um, managers maybe who never would have taught things like that, like 30 seconds after um, after yeah. Johnny, Dooley's, Johnny Dooley's free, the ball was back out again and mm. it was kind of chaos. And five seconds later, Pat O'Connor was in and it was a goal. Like, it's funny, managers yeah. and coaches are now thinking, why do maybe do we have to allow this to happen? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's kind of, it's a different way to, of the game being looked at. Uh, Mark, you've been brilliant with your time. The last question I put to you uh, was four in a row for Limerick this year. The last 
25, 30 minutes of the All-Ireland final, I'd say, was as good as anything I've seen since they mm. kind of really came on the scene in 2018. They're going for five next year. Like, where do you see them at going into next year? Do you think they'll be much... Do you think there's a potential that, that Will could slip into six long term or do you expect any changes and where do you see them at going into 2024? Yeah, I think look good shape. I think they're in good shape. I think they found their, their feet when they went to Croke Park last year. Probably might approach the season a little bit differently next year in that. I think they were very good in the league and looked outstanding in the league finding against Kilkenny. Probably probably showed a bit too much form too soon. And uh, I know they went to Portugal and I don't know what happened. I, I, I assume they did a lot of training in Portugal what seemed a bit leggy after that. Um, I could certainly see them next year maybe approaching the league in a, in a more experimental fashion and give all those young lads and the likes of the Cotton O'Neill's an extended kind of a run. Colin Cocker needs an extended, extended run. Aidan O'Connor needs an extended run. So there's an, a, a number of young fellas there, I think, that they deserve their, 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 their go during the league and see how they get on. So I think uh, the goal for Limerick will be, obviously, the, the Munster Championship. It was ropey enough last year maybe to be in better form for the Munster Championship and time their run so that they they kind of hit the ground running before the Munster Championship. And after that, it's a quick enough championship because you're at all in the final stage. Very, very, you know, there's only a couple of months in it. But I think if Limerick can get out of Munster into Pro Park, I think they'll be very, very hard to beat. But obviously, that'll be dependent on, you know, injuries and that. We were fortunate enough last year. We got over the line with, with Sean Finn doing his cruise. He's going to be back next year. So I think overall, they're in good, good, good shape at the moment. And I suppose the question is, will be where the, 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 the big challenger is going to come from. It's probably been clear over the last number of years. Um, I think Cork is probably there's definitely a kick in Cork. They have lots lots of players if they can maybe change the culture there a, a slight little bit and and um, and maybe um, and and maybe do the the things not maybe associated with Cork. I think they certainly have the talent and the pace to trouble Limerick if they get into Croke Park. But uh, it's going to be a fascinating championship. And uh, if it's anything like last year, just bring it on. It's amazing. You just need to survive Munster now, don't you? You just need to make sure that your name is in the hat for the, the All Ireland stages, really. And that's <laughs> like if you're thinking who's going to beat Limerick next year, you're thinking the biggest obstacle they will face is getting out of Munster. If they get out of Munster and, as you say, get back to Crow Park, they seem to be a Crow Park team. But that it was they very nearly knocked out in Munster this year when you look back on it. I should go down to the last day. You know, it was, it was, and like the, the car came, like, uh, you know, car get over that and Limerick are effectively out, probably. You know, now there was a spanner in, in, the, in the works with Waterford and Tip, but, but certainly going into, you know, the, that last day in Munster where anyone re realistically could qualify by, by Waterford, like, that's the level you're talking about. And like in Munster Championship, everyone just comes out swinging, like, you know, and no one is able to, to, to pull the handbrake or to go in at 70%. Everyone comes out swinging, and it's just who's able to stay standing the longest is going to go through. And it's going to be the very, very same next year. Um, Limerick have to go to, to Ennis again. It's going to be very, very difficult. Um, and like all the matches are local derbies in Munster, and, you know, it's going to be a um, toss of a coin between a lot of these teams. So, yeah, I think if Limerick can navigate their way out of Munster, even if they came in in th third place, I wouldn't be too worried just to get into Crow Park. Once they get into Crow Park, I think they'll be hard to beat because they like playing there. Um, they've never really lost a game there since 2019 against Kilkenny. Um, so it'll be hard to play for and uh, yeah, the best team win. Mark, thanks a million for your time. I really appreciate it. I'll see, you, I'll see you at some game soon, no doubt. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. Cheers, Bye. Mark. Good man. That was Mark, uh, Limerick legend Mark Foley. And delighted to say the guests are flying this week. Uh, joined by Jason Byrne from The Sun, who was in uh, Pierce Stadium yesterday. A very calm Pierce Stadium, by all accounts, Jason, which is very unusual. Yeah, Mick, there, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a scent of a breeze there at all. It was mad. Thanks for putting me on after Mark Foley. Tough act, tough act to follow. <laughs> the pressure on my shoulders is, is enormous here. But yeah. We were saying, like, I was into the tail end of the, the first game, the junior game, which was one bit on the slow one. There wasn't a breeze kind to be seen. It was, uh, th that was the first big shock of the day, but there was no shock in the pitch after that. When, uh, I've, ne I've, ne I've never, never seen the like of it. I've never seen the like of it in, in Pear Stadium. A calm day in Pear Stadium, especially. Yeah, in, in I, was there for the, I was there for the, the Galway Mayo match in the, the All Ireland preliminary quarterfinals in the football during the summer, and it was blowing an absolute gale. <laughs> <laughs> and yesterday on county final day, they, they couldn't have asked for better, so it was it was great. Like it made for a, I wouldn't say a classic, but it was an interesting tussle anyway. Um, but but you have to hand it to to Thomas's. I wouldn't. I know they've uh, they've used being written off before, but um, I don't think anybody wrote them off this year. But third of more, yet you, you have to feel sorry for them. Mick, like they were they were going for the first title since 1985, and they've been running this Thomas's team to the wire. Anytime they've met over the years, and they just still can't get over that line. Like, but 
you know, Thomas's are just a phenomenal club that when you go back and think that they only won their first county title in 2012 and they have eight now. And I was just looking through the I was just looking through the pen picks here in the program. Like like this is nearly a totally new panel. Some of these lads are 22, 23, and they have five, six, hmm. five or six county medals already. Like, you know, it's just remarkable. Like and that winning culture that that started there in 2012 is is there to stay, I would say. Yeah, like it, it's a, it was another. They're just getting really good at eking out, eking out these games in Galway in particular. They were obviously, I'm sure, fairly stung after the All Ireland semi final last year where they were beaten by Dunloy. But it finished St Thomas's two twelve, Turlock Moore one thirteen. Similar enough score to, score line to win they met in the COVID final in 2020. There was one score in it again. Um, just talk to me a bit about Aina Burke. Um, he's like the tallies he put up puts up at club level are absolutely outstanding. His goals were really the difference yesterday again between him and you have him on one edge, the edge of one square, and you have Fintan Burke at the edge of the other square. Like he's uh, talked about Willow Dunne, who been a force in nature. Like Fintan Burke is an absolute bull. Like he's so hard to get around, isn't he? Like when he's in his pomp, the chest is out, and you just kind of think you're not going to be able to get around this fella at all. But it really was a Burke at either, either end of the either end of the field that did a lot of the damage. Yeah, that was that was the big difference. Like, and it would have been so easy to get in him out of the match, given that he got two two. But it's funny, like in terms of possession, I wouldn't say he was on it that much. But just when he gets that snuff a goal, there's only ever going to be one result. And Brendan Fillion had a great battle with Fenton on the edge of the square at the other end of the field, but he didn't get an absolute snuff. And just Fenton was mopping up all the ball that rained down on him, especially in that second half when you know Turlock Moore really coming at Thomas is hard and. They really made it. They, they had a great spell at the end of the first half to come back within a point. It was one six to eight points. Like they, they fell one four to a point behind. It was a disastrous start for them. Like, in, but in his first goal in thirteen minutes, you, you know you have to hand it to him. It was a magnificent finish. The first touch and strike to find that top corner. You know it was the only way he was going to beat Darrell Walsh and get it into the onion bag, and it, it really set them on their way. Like, but you have to hand it to Turlock. Like they did. Six points in a row on the board, I think. Um, early days in the the second half to take the lead, like. But this Thomas's team, like you know, you can compare them to you can compare them to Limerick, the great Brian Cody Kilkenny teams, Dublin footballers under Jim Gavin. They just do not panic. They are wired to win. They are coached for every single situation that comes their way. And even when Dahi Burke pushed up the field yesterday and really started to put the squeeze on them around the middle, they just knew exactly what to do and. You know, the story for me yesterday was was David Burke. Like, you know, he came on in the, the semi-final and came on yesterday and really, really set things down. This is a guy who'd done his cruise in March, training with Galway. He had reconstructive surgery on his knee in April and he was telling us after the game, myself and your, your colleague, um, Frank Roach, were speaking to him after the game and it was never in doubt in his head. Like, you speak to so many lads who are victims of this injury and just he was like, I am going to be back playing at the latter stages of the club championship. A, he was confident the club would be there, and B, he was full sure he was going to be on the pitch. And the fact that he came on and made the difference that he did yesterday, you have to hand it to him. Like, absolute phenomenal recovery story. He he was honest, frank and honest, saying he's got a long way to go. But oh, it was just it was hard not to be delighted for him. Like, he's, he's such a legend. Like, I've known him a long time from when I was working in Goy BFM. And, Speaking to him back in the day when, you know, Thomas's hadn't been anywhere near a county title and didn't even have mm-hmm. one. And, like, God, he'll go down as some legend in that club. As well, all the Burks and the Coonies out there who've just been racking up the medals to beat the band. So it's it's a phenomenal achievement for them. It really, really is. And they've equaled history now. Turlock Moore were the only team in Galway to do the six in a row in 1966. So to equal their record by beating them in the final is some achievement like and uh they will really want to say you know it wasn't didn't come up yesterday but getting back to Croke Park now will be massive for them and they'll really want to right those wrongs on the national stage but in terms of Galway it's such a hard championship to win and to dominate it like the Galway Intermediate Championship the standard is off the charts that's the Galway Intermediate Championship and there's a lot of great junior teams as well but to, to do that at senior level in that county is just is just staggering um so fair play to them and unlike we'd say uh, or Lachlan's who won in Kilkenny and a few other teams they obviously are straight through to the semi-final now so they, 
they know they well they don't know who they're going to be playing, but they don't have to go through all the jeopardy of playing various provincial games as well. So they're they're two wins away from potentially being all Ireland champions again. So uh, we'll just fly through the scores really quickly. So Anna Burke finished up with two two. Connor Cooney had like one of his quieter games, which is a good sign for Thomas is that they're winning games, winning this game. And anyway, without him uh, been on fire, he finished at three points, two frees. Uh, Shane Cooney, Dara Burke, Victor Manzo, two points each and a point from Ushin Flannery. Uh, Connor Walsh uh, finished top score for Turlock Moore with seven points. Uh, was, there, was there just a bit of cuteness kind of down the home stretch from Thomas? Is they know that position so well, how to see out a game kind of looking at the game did it kind of just feel like that that's maybe what Turlock were missing and Thomas's were just kind of been that bit cuter down the stretch yeah big time Mick like when you look at like from the 48s 48s man if the game was level and then like you go 12 minutes later and Thomas's are four points ahead and then Ina gets that second goal and it's just ball burst game over like really felt sorry for for Connor Walsh as well he's a great lad I used to work with his dad Sean and Goy BFM Sean stepped away from, from commentary duty yesterday because there was just so much at stake uh, with his own flesh and blood in the field. So it would have been a hard one to call for him. But you know, Connor's a great lad. He's um he's a brilliant, brilliant free taker, and he's been unlucky not to be in and around Galway squads uh, for the National League under Henry. I know he's he's played a few games in the Walsh Cup, but he's an excellent free taker. And you know, Connor Cooney did have a fairly off day. He got a brilliant score from play in the second half when they really, really needed one. But he missed two frees in the first half that he would normally put over in his sleep. And, uh, you know, he looked a bit jittery at times after that. And Dahi Burke was kind of standing off him as well. So, you know, he had space in front of him to run into. He was unlucky as well to have a goal chopped off uh, early in the second half when, when it was blown back for a free. And Thomas has felt very aggrieved at that. There was plenty of needle too, plenty of needle down in the lane. Kenneth Burke was coming onto the pitch just... just uh, you know, having words with the referee a few times as well. But, uh, you know, and Aina was on a yellow uh, very early as well, Mick, and there was a couple of times where he was kind of dicing with death throughout the second half, and he was lucky maybe a couple of times he wasn't showing a second yellow, but, you know, it, it paid dividends when he got that second goal because that really was the clincher. Um, that's Tur Turlick Moore team. Are from, like, they're a great side as well. Like, like Dahi Burke is just incredible and that they have some great players. It's just so unlucky for them that they're coming up against... They've come up against this machine in, in Galway Hurling for the guts of the last decade, you know. And they are a winning machine. Like, they just, uh, they're not winning. I think their final margins, um, because I think their final margins in nearly each of the last six finals is a score. I think in yeah. nearly nearly every game, they beat Claren Bridge by a score a couple of years ago. I think me and you both covered that game. Last year, it was a replay and a score, I think, against Ocre. It was a score again the other day. Um, And as I said, I think they face... I think it's Leinster versus Ulster in the All-Ireland semi-final and it will be a semi-final against the Munster champions who, at the minute, you'd probably say, you know, Bally Gunner or in a peership, Bally Gunner are probably favourites to win in All-Ireland. Did you get any sense of that sticking in their craw a bit like when they were beaten in Crow Park in that semi-final this year, that that was a bit of motivation to try and get back to that stage again? Um, I know that when they were beaten by Ballyhale in that All-Ireland club final when they were blown away, all they wanted was a chance to get back to a similar stage and have a go up Ali Hale again and they nearly beat them only for TJ Reid's free in that semi in that semi final. I think me and you were down covering the game in Galway the same day that day actually and listening to it on the radio. Um yeah. but like did you get that sense of that they want to get back there again that one All Ireland is not enough for this group? It didn't it definitely didn't come up yesterday, but it has to be in the back of their minds and I'm sure Kenneth Burke will be doing everything he can over, over the next few weeks to have them right for that. Um, you know, the way the calendar is now, it's, you know, can people even say that, God, if, if they'd have been in playing a, in a proper provincial championship beforehand, would it, would they have been more primed for an All-Ireland semi-final? But then they probably would have come up against Bally Hill, so it's hard to know. Like, But just coming in cold to an All-Ireland semi-final like that when other teams have had that bit of competitive action under their belts in the provincial title in the in the cabinet. Like it's it's hard to know does it count against them. But so many great Galway clubs before have have just gone on to 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 win the All Ireland like, you know, like Portumna and Gort and Alton Ray and so many of those great teams of the past that have that have gone on to do it. Like so it's hard to know. Like but the tighter calendar now will definitely suit them like like the gap before for for the Galway champions was Colossal at times uh, when it came to waiting for an All Ireland semi final. So 
Uh, yeah, they'll definitely they'll definitely have enjoyed their night uh, last night anyway, and uh, no doubt they're they're toasting themselves today as well. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens for them. Um, you know that the nature of that flat performance when they got to Crow Park, uh, will surely be in their back of the minds for sure, Mick. Yeah, but like this this is a new, fresh, hungry panel by and large as well as I said when you you know you've got your James Regans and your your David Burks and whatnot like but and your Connor Cooney's obviously but like some of these lads are only 20 21 and they're they're really really coming of age now fast with so much silverware in the back pocket it's it's, it's just phenomenal because like if you've ever been out there like it's it's so rural like you know there's no Heidi, yeah there's no like it's it, it covers a few different parishes the club like so it's kind of you know there's lads who be 10 miles apart and stuff and but they've got so many family connections between the Coonies and the Burks and they're just the lifeblood of the whole team and the baton's just been passed continuously like you know when Kenneth and David and the lad's father was manager and in his father obviously as well like and now, now Kenneth's in the in the banished yard bib, and it wouldn't surprise you if David Burke was the banished yard in a few years <laughs> in line, but there's, there's no sign of him finishing yet like it's just I feel nearly bad for Kenneth thinking like that God, this could be the end of the end of David Burke when he done the Christian like but Ah uh, no, so- to be fair, I remember you said it to me at the time. Like you weren't you weren't the only one because it, you get you get to yeah. that sort of age and you're mm-hmm. thinking, oh like the six month recoveries are gone at that age. It's usually a year, 15 months, do you know what I mean? And just even on David Burke, just go through a couple of quick quotes. Uh he was chatting to yourself and Frank Roach after the game. He's just said, Look, I got the injury and it was tough to take. It was disappointing with Galway initially, but I knew I had to do the work. It's all the small things, really. People think, What did you do? But it wasn't nothing special. You still have to do the small things, eating right and sleeping right. They add up as well. The point five percent, as I call them. But look, I fully believed when I sat down with Cottle Moran in surgery, I told him there was a date in my head and I told him that seven months down the line I was going to be back for it. In fairness to them and the team that was around me and the support of Laura, uh, she's put up with me all year going training and to the gym. And all the while we have a baby, Robin, and uh, it was tough, but it was enjoyable. And it's great to be back here with the lads. It's an amazing, it's an amazing comeback, really. Um, it's very similar to the similar kind of time scale, even to Bernard Brogan's one. Who, where he was nearly at the end of his days as well, and I'd imagine it's just a hunch now, but like I, I could definitely see David Burke in a Galway jersey next year if he's only just getting back and he's and he's managed correctly. I I, I don't see why not really to be honest. Which I think he's he's thirty three. I don't I don't see why not. And it's funny mm-hmm. when I look back at the All Ireland semi final against Limerick a couple of years ago, he started wing forward and he's he was pulled at half time, and you're kind of thinking. You know, maybe he's coming to the end. He's had a couple of great years with Galway since. Very good season in twenty one. Very good season in twenty two. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised. He was. I think he was doing water most of the year with Galway and was heavily involved in the sidelines. So Henry obviously sees him ta- still having a big part. So wouldn't be a bit surprised um if he's still involved there. Jason, I know you were in Galway yesterday. Just going to throw a couple of quick football results at you. Have you ever seen anything like Ballina, Stephen Knight, six points, briefly four points in a county final? <laughs> the commentary around this and some of the, the talk around it, like when when teams can set up in that way for it to be that low a score, and like I heard a lot of neutrals were leaving at half time as well. Like it's you'd be worried for you'd be worried for some, maybe where football is going when you have these type of games, particularly when it, that sort of thing is happening in, in a marquee fixture. There was nothing to write home about by all accounts in this game at all. Yeah, like when you see several high-profile pundits saying it is by far the worst game of football they've ever seen. Like, like a, I'm a Donegal man. Club football in Donegal takes an awful kicking, but like some of the results in the Donegal Club Championship this year were like hurling results compared to us. Like, um, you know, oh, it's just... Like no one really seemed to really know why it was so bad. Like it was just like I don't know. I only saw bits of clips and that uh, online last night when I got home. Like and that final chance that Bravey had. Oh in the yeah, ball. it's it's, it's yeah. it seemed to sum up. Like they had a lion ball and uh, they were two points down. They had a lion ball. Oh, they just get it in around the house and it ended up going wide, like re- and really badly wide. And everyone just seemed to say that that kind of sum- summed up the, the quality or maybe the, the lack of quality. I'm sure Ballina won't care. Um, they're the goods of 20 years waiting for one. Briefly's wait goes on again. I think that could be the, their fifth final defeat, which would be very, very difficult to swallow for them. And I know Aidan O'Shea, I thought he had a very good year with Mayo. He had a brilliant year with Briefly, probably up until the final. Um, but just a comment in here from Parik Ryan, he just said, agree 100%. Football is set for a grim future if county finals go the route of the Mayo. And it's just... 
I don't know. You're kind of nearly lucky to get a really good football game at this stage. It's such a, you know what I mean? It's there's such arm wrestles at this stage, um, yeah. and like a, a two point lead in this game was like leading by fifteen points with the the amount of scores that were in it. Um, it's probably wasn't the greatest spectacle, but as I said. Uh, Ballina won't care. Open Derry, it finished Glen 113, O'Donovan Ross is seven points. Are you of the same mind as me? This is a three in a row for Glen and Derry. That the only thing that's on their mind is hoping and praying that they will get a go at Crokes at some stage again. Um, and like it would be it would be that big heavyweight clash. It would be the Bally Gunner versus Bally Hay. Like it's it's kind of what everyone wants. It's a long way out. There's a lot of steps they have to go through, and there's a lot of steps Crokes have to go through. But it'd be it'd be the dream class from a media point of view, anyway. I'll put it to you that way. <laughs> it would, yeah. And like you know, we've we've been talking to, to uh, Connor Glass about this a couple of times, like since then, and like they must like just everything that went on around it must have been so hard to take. Like you know, when you're when you're in dreamland like that with the club, like you know, just coming on the scene. Uh, getting your first dairy title and going on to win three in a row, great manager, so many fantastic footballers to get that close and for that to happen uh, to them <laughs> on the biggest stage against Kilmacud Crooks and all the fallout from afterwards. Like, you know, it was draining for everybody. It was it was draining for, for Crooks no more than it was for them. Like, and, you know, in fairness to Crooks, they've, they've spoken very openly, Shane Walsh has spoken very openly about how draining the whole thing was and on top of his transfer and then the fallout that occurred afterwards, like, and, you know, it's, is that title always going to be tainted? Like, it probably is for me, do you know what I mean? Like, if, it's just, like, it's, it's different when you go on a club journey like that, like, like you, you've played in these games yourself, Mick, you know what it's like and the emotional investment and that extra emotion that comes with, going that far with your own and with the lads you've you've played with all up along like so yeah it'll definitely be in the back of their heads and it'll be a brave man to back against them for Ulster now but you know you've <laughs> again that's that's an absolute minefield as well like you've Cross McGlenn back in business big time you've Trelly coming out of Tyrone Neve Connell coming out of Donegal who feel like that's this is a big next step for them, given given what they've achieved. Uh, but you know, haven't done it on the the provincial stage. Kilcool will be back. Um, you know, Ulster in itself is such a mind feel like that. But yeah, it has to be in the back of the minds, doesn't it? And like they've such a brilliant manager, a manager who stuck with them despite the dairy job coming at him, the Donegal job coming at him. He turned both of those jobs down in the last two years. So you know. Malachi will be he'll be raring to get them back to Crow Park as well. But they have to win Ulster first and it's a massive, massive uh, ask in itself, you know. Yeah, and as Richard Hogan says there, Glenn will have enough to worry about in Ulster. I'm sure Kilku will like another crack at them. Like Glenn might be looking for a bit of revenge and redemption at the latter stages, the all Ireland stages, but I'd say Kill McCoo are looking for it in Ulster after that Ulster final defeat last year. And as you said, Derry, or as you said, Ulster is an absolute minefield. Just fly through another few Quick uh, football results, a mad, another mad kind of result in Tyrone. Trillick won 13, Ergil Kieran 13 points. Don't think any team has retained Tyrone Senior Football Championship in the last 18 years. And uh, I know the, the absent Shane Stapleton was uh, tweeting earlier about, like, Nafina won without Donald Burke. Uh, Trillick won without Matty Donnelly. I'm probably forgetting a couple of other teams as well. Like, it's mad to think that Trillick could win a Tyrone title without their best player. And what is it? They're they're not a million miles, obviously, from from you up home. There. What is it about how cutthroat Tyrone is that you can't do back to back? It's obviously cutthroat in the sense as well that it's a knockout championship. But I think Eric and Kieran were up there high, even in the bet for the All Ireland, and and now they're gone. Canavans, etc. Peter Hart as well. Um, such a difficult championship to win by all accounts. Oh yeah, phenomenally difficult. Like my my uncle was a my uncle Damien was a selector with Oma the year they won it. Like and. So so much goes into it, like that they're they're usually white then by the time it comes to the Ulster campaign, you know. I think a lot of Tyrone clubs have, have fallen on the provincial sword because so much goes into winning that club campaign and it's such a big deal. Like and you know, there's so many club rivalries there, there's so many clubs there that are on top of each other as well. Do you know what I mean? Like and so many strong intermediate clubs too. Like you look at the Moy there who had a phenomenal side over the years, like and you know, they they couldn't even get out of the intermediate championship, like and you'd 
yeah, it's just like the those those games are really our wars of attrition. Like you know, they they might they might be of the same standard to watch as maybe the Mayo final sometimes, but like they're they're absolute bruising battles. Like and to to do back to back there and to do it without their best player as well and to do it after extra time is just a phenomenal achievement. And as you said, against an Aragal Kieran team that has so much talent um up and down the pitch it's just incredible like I, I didn't get stuck into the reports from that one too much yet but i saw quotes from richie donnelly there this morning just probably uh you know really pin, pinch you moment for him as well like to, to to get there like so yeah fair play to them like it's it's huge like and pe- people were people were teeing up the big area here Kieran cross mcglenn clash in ulster and it's, it's not going to happen now it's yeah, Trillic, Trillic will relish taking them on now instead because people were teeing up that one. Eric O'Kearn did they go on Cross McGlenn and nearly a nearly a de facto uh Ulster semi final to, to see who would take on Glenn. Like so it's it's brilliant for Trillic, it really is. Just goes to show you definitely can't get ahead of yourself anyway in the club championships anyway. Um but Jason, you've been brilliant with your time. Thanks a million, and uh, no doubt we'll chat fairly soon again. All right. Good man, Mike. Take care. Cheers, Jason. Good man, talk to you soon, Pat. So just fly through another uh, couple of quick results, other football championship finals. Uh, there was an upset in the Watford final. It finished Rack Gormack 1-9, the Nair 1-6. So the Nair have generally been the dominant uh, the dominant force in Watford in recent years. But uh, we have new champions in Watford. Uh, Cork, we have new champions as well. It finished Castlehaven 11 points. Nemo 9, 5 points from Michael Hurley, who seems to be in superb form this year. That really proved the difference there. Um, so Castlehaven are on top there. So, uh, and I think I think uh, Brian Hurley was dominant as well. Obviously, Michael's brother. They will give Munster a good shot, I'm sure. In the Wicklow Senior Football Championship final replay, Blessington won their second title in three years. They finished Blessington eleven points. Rat New won six. And in the London Senior Football Championship final, it finished Fulham Irish eleven points. Uh, Tyr Connell Gales eight points. Um, the, Tom O'Keane is asking where the Saint is. Don't worry, the Saint will be back. Well, unfortunately, he'll be he'll be back on Thursday's show. Uh, Park Ranger says the Tyrone Football Championship seems to be similar to Tip Hurlem. On teams have to go through so much to be there at the end. They're already floored by the provincials. Yeah, be interested to see how Kilda can go on. You know, what you'd have to say the softer side of uh, the Munster Championship this year. But thanks a million, folks, for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate. It. We'll be back on Thursday's show where we preview all the action once again and we will see you then. Thanks a million folks.